Well, today we continue our family series. And if you were with us last week, you know, we introduced the fact, the idea that nothing throws more chaos and dysfunction into the family situation than when the family itself splits. It is devastation to the utmost. And we looked at Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 19, where he talks about marriage and divorce. And we discovered those are some pretty stern words. Very high expectations from our Lord to us. And we discovered there that marriage is God's idea. It was His invention from the beginning. And the plan from the beginning was one man, one woman, one lifetime. That's it. The only man or woman you ever have sexual intercourse with is your wife, your husband, and that happens the day after you say, I did, I do. That's the plan. One man, one woman, one lifetime. No shacking around, no jacking around, no laying around, no going around. One man, one woman, one lifetime. And God's idea is that that marriage covenant be exclusive and permanent. And we, when we take the initiative to split that, chaos abounds in all society. Because the family is meant to be the core building block for all society. But we also discovered that humanity at its best day is questionable. Me and you, we got issues. And God knows that. That's why he sent his son to the cross. And we blow it. And God is able to redeem and make new all the things that we blow. So forgetting what is behind, wherever you are today, that's where you start. God can make all things new. He can redeem any situation, no matter how much we've blown it apart. But start today. And those are heavy words. Today, we want to talk about marriage and divorce again. But realizing that last week, man, it was, it was heavy and it was deep. It's heavy and it's deep because that's the way Jesus said it. But today, because last week was a little bit heavy, we want to be a little bit lighter and approach it with a little bit of a lighter framework, but no less serious because the message is serious. So you can imagine that Bill and I, um, Bill, Bill and I, <coughs> in all our years of ministry together, we've spent significant time giving premarital counseling, marital counseling. And even sadly, walking with people through separation and divorce. And you can imagine, if you combine all those years, we've heard some pretty crazy things over the years. I mean, crazy things about why people, reasons people give for why they're about to split their family in half and wreck their marriage. Crazy things. And these are things that people actually believe. They actually believe these reasons are legitimate, and they actually believe that the Bible supports them and God is in favor of them. It's crazy what people will say, especially when they're in the throes of difficulty and conflict that they don't want to work through. And so today, and, and the, the reason we're doing this is today because the enemy just puts shade over us, and he has a way of duping us. And today we just want to dispel the myth of some of the things the enemy the lies that he sends us about how he wants to disrupt and destroy our families. And so today we've come up with a list, and it's longer than 10, but we've come up with a list. Top 10 craziest things, reasons we've ever heard from people for why they divorce. And we're going to give you our top 10. And these are things that people actually believe 
and believe that God supports. And we just want to tell you, the top 10 that are actually not our top 10, that are crazy and not supported by the Bible. Now, the list could be longer than 10, but we're going to do the 10. But before we go to the 10, there is a short list. That's the long list. But there is a short list that we want to share with you today as well. Because here's the deal. There's a short list of what we gather, two reasons, where Scripture actually does allow for divorce. Now, let us be very clear. The Scriptures never advocate for or recommend divorce. You need to understand, hear us. God's desire and will is always, no matter what is going on, for your marriage to succeed. Matter of fact, in Malachi 2.16, he said to himself, I hate divorce. Divorce is his enemy. He wants your marriage to succeed. So you don't need to look at this as, what's my out clause? That's not what we're saying. That's not what the Bible is saying. But in order to deal with the ten, you've got to go with the two first. Because here's the deal. In every marriage, it requires not 50-50, but 100-100%. And if one party don't want to be part of that, you can only do so much. And God's not going to hold the other person captive for it. So to deal with the short list, Bill's going to talk to us about that. Last week as we were in Matthew 19, and we discussed divorce and what Jesus had to say about it, which really was talking about what Jesus had to say about marriage. There's one verse that we didn't cover all the way, and part of that, it was a long message anyway. So that's part of today, and that is in Matthew chapter 19, Verse 9, and he says, this is Jesus, And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. So one allowance that Jesus gives for divorce is sexual immorality, adultery. But notice this, it is an allowance. It is not a command. In other words, I think God is most glorified even in the midst of sexual immorality, for there to be reconciliation, for there to be forgiveness. But because of the nature of sexual intimacy and the way God created it and where he takes two people and he makes them one, when that bond is broken, he allows for divorce. The other one we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 15. There the Bible says, But if the unbeliever, unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. What we call this is desertion. This is when you have made every effort, but the other person walks, and there ends up being nothing you can do about it. Now, I will tell you, in those situations, you let them file for the divorce. But ultimately, you are doing everything you can to save your marriage. And here, they walk anyway. And they're gone. You know, a marriage takes two people. One person can't save a marriage by themselves. You have to have two people. So desertion is another one. You... You might say, there are only two. What about, what about abuse? Well, listen, when you are being abused, you need to get away and you need to find safety. You don't need to submit yourself to that physical abuse. But by the same token, that does not mean that that means you go out and immediately file for divorce. Again, I say we do things God's way and be above reproach if there's going to be divorce filed for you do everything that you can to stop that but if they go desertion abuse there's only so much that you can do but those are the two in scripture where God allows but does not encourage nor demand there to be divorce sexual immorality and desertion. So, hang on, Bill. Stay with me now. So we've got the, the short list. Now the list of 10. Now, to illustrate to you how 
sometimes, and look, we're not knocking anybody here, but these are things that, man, I wish, and I mean, I've been married happily for um, 18 years this May, so. But I have it down, boy. I know, right? Hey, now, look out. For but, real. uh <laughs> So we're not here to knock anybody or anything, but I wish, man, somebody would have shared this with me long before I got married because I ain't going to lie. Some of the things I've thought, I've felt, and we want to show you just how absurd this list is and how much the enemy uses it. So before we get into the 10, to show you the absurdity of some of the things people say, we want to illustrate it to you through a set of marriage vows. So in other words, all, we've taken the 10 we're using today, and if we were to infuse those into a set of marriage vows that you would actually say and share on your wedding day, how ridiculous would that sound? Well, we want to show you. So I need, um, I need a, a couple up here. So Alan and Angie Ennis volunteered a week ago to do this, and they've been looking forward to it. So y'all come on up. Yes, they this are happily married. This ain't a renewal married. of vows. This is Just not renewal. Yeah, and they actually knew nothing about you this. You wait till I say kiss the bride before you do something like they that. They knew nothing about this. All right, y'all switch sides. Alan, you get on the other side. All right. And put your hands together and look at each other. Now, let's just assume now, Alan, you're not going to repeat after Bill. We're going to go through the whole set of vows. But you imagine e each of you were going to say these set of vows to one another based on the ten reasons that people use. So this is, this is kind of how it would look if we actually infuse the reasons that people use. So here we go. I, Alan, take the Angie to be my wedded wife, to have and to hold. At least until such time, I decide if and when I would rather have and hold someone else who might be a more desirable option. From this day forward. Understanding that this day and forward means that one day I may feel differently, which in such case would nullify the events, moments, and romance of this day. For better, for worse. As long as, Angie, the better, the better includes sex at Alan's desired times, you gain no more than five pounds for the duration of the marriage, agree to deal promptly with any facial blemishes, hair loss, mood changes, or female issues. This also to include Alan being gone for six months during menopause, provided you're still together at that point, and you agree to his specifications for parenting and the number of children that you have. For richer, for poorer. As long as the richer outweighs the poorer consistently. And as long as you can still afford your desired toys, vehicles, habits, vacations, the most up-to-date technology, and a lifestyle that matches everyone else around you. And this to include not giving to the church faithfully so as not to threaten your financial comfort. In sickness and in health. As long as the sickness doesn't compromise your desire to be happy in any way. In which case, if you divorce... Alan receives material possessions, and you assume financial responsibility for any children or expenses that may incur during the marriage. Did you just say wow? <laughs> Several times. <laughs> to love and to cherish. Provided we don't fall out of love, or we simply decide that we were never in love to begin with, which would give allowance for exploring better options to find that lost soulmate who is still wandering out there aimlessly waiting for you to come to them, which in this case, sorry Angie, today you're the wrong choice. <laughs> Till death do us part according to God's holy ordinance. Unless, of course, we have differences that are simply irreconcilable and cannot be worked out. Or if the marriage begins, begins to be too much of a sacrifice. In which case, for God's holy ordinance, we'll just agree that we weren't spiritually mature at the time of this marriage and that God will just have to forgive us. And there, too, I pledge myself to you. Well, I mean, for right now, and I'm, as far as I know... Until such time, we feel different and decide to unpledge ourselves to one another. In which case, making this day null and void. For which we agree to pay back the father of the bride for all the wedding expenses of this day. And promise to properly dispose of any and all wedding pictures. Alan, if you agree to these terms, say, I do. See? <laughs> all right, thank you all. Give him a hand, people. Now, you see how absurd that is? 
if we actually incorporated those things into a marriage house. The day of your marriage, you're not thinking about that stuff. But you'd be amazed 10, 15, 20 years later, people come up and they actually come up with that stuff and think it's legitimate. So, people, here is our list of top 10. Bill, my list, my, well, and these are in no particular order, but one reason people give is my spouse is a bum. Or my spouse is a huge disappointment. Or I think I could do better than this. If your spouse, listen to me, and all of you, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but if your spouse has ever disappointed you or let you down, I got three words for you. Get in line. <laughs> it's going to happen. You are going to be disappointed by your spouse. Things are going to happen. You are going to be let down. Think, think about it this way. Listen, you know the Andy Griffith show, right? Right? I mean, the town of Mayberry, have you ever considered the fact that the reason the town of Mayberry is so peaceful and tranquil is the fact that pretty much all the major people on that show are single? <laughs> think about it. There's one married guy, and it's the town drunk, Otis. You ever thought about that? <laughs> Marriage is hard. You are going to disappoint one another. Listen, bags are going to form under the eyes. Wrinkles are going to form. Waistlines are going to expand. Skin is going to start to look more like leather than bed sheets. It's going to be awful. Listen, let me tell you something. So, some, some, of you, some of you, listen, you, 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 you young ladies, you need to know this. And you young men, things are going to happen. You, you men, that, that, that hottie that used to run around the beach with a two-piece bathing suit with abs, one day you're going to look up and she's going to be sitting in a, in, a, in a beach chair. And she's going to have one of those one-piece flowery bathing suits on, one of them things that covers the stomach. And she's going to be wearing one of those big hats with beady sunglasses. And when it's time for y'all to get up, she's going to... Help me, help me. And that's, gonna, that's, that's probably going to happen to you. It's a good possibility. And, and, and ladies, the volleyball, you used to watch your man play volleyball on the beach. He was bronze. He was beauty. He was, he was awesome. But you're going to look, and he's going to be sitting in that same chair one day, and it's going to look like somebody took that volleyball and implanted it into his stomach. <laughs> and they took all his hair off his head and start putting it on his back and his ears. It's going to happen. Listen to me. You're going to be disappointed. Things are going to happen. Vacations will not be taken. Dreams may not be met. Things may happen. And hear me, hear me, hear me. You're going to wake up one day and look at your spouse and go... <laughs> and when that happens, you need to know, you need to know this, hear me, you are completely normal. Some of you people, if you're in your 20s and 30s, and listen, some of you people in your marriage, you need to spend as much time in the front of the mirror as you can. Spend as much time looking at each other now while you can because things change. And when you hit middle age kingdom, you don't just glide into it. You just, you, one day you wake up and you look at the mirror and you go, I'm as ugly as the rest of my friends. It just happens. <laughs> when it happens, you are normal. That's life. Now hear me. That's not an excuse to be lazy, to take your spouse for granted. To let it all just go downhill. If you don't like the way you look, do something about it. you got to find your ways to reinvent your love and keep things fresh and keep things new. And that's going to be a struggle. It's going to be a fight. Every marriage is going to have highs and lows. But stay the course. It's not a reason to give up. You'll want to follow the words in Colossians chapter 3. Bear with each other. That word bear means to persist. Be patient. 
persevere, stick it out, even suffer. That word is there, suffer. But stick it out. Bear with one another. Hang on. Around every bad time, some of the best times are coming. Forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Remember, you're called to be one. You're representing the gospel. Finally, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body, because what you do affects this body and your marriage body, you were called to peace. And be, hear this, hear this, and be thankful. It's hard to complain when you fill up those empty spaces with thankfulness. When things become normal, don't focus so much on what's wrong. Focus on what's right. That's one I can apply to my own marriage. Number two. Top ten ridiculous reasons to get a divorce. My friends say I should get a divorce. <laughs> Holy smoke. You say, you're making that one up. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. My friends think I should get a divorce. They're, they're encouraged. They say, I don't need to, I, I deserve better. I don't need to be hanging around this person anymore. They're not treating me right. And so my friends think I need to get a divorce. You know, my friends love me. They want what's best for me. And they say what's best for me is to get out of this relationship. All right, well, I got a few things to say about that. Uh, number one, your friends... First of all, I've been your sounding board, which we all need sounding boards, but your friends have only heard your side of the story. And you say, that's right. Why do they need to hear the wrong side? You know, my side is the right side. I know what I'm saying. This is all true. Well, listen, everybody's got a perspective. There's two sides to every story I have found over time. I need to hear it all. I need to hear from everyone. And the truth is that, with, that, that advice and counsel you get from people that doesn't have the full story is advice you cannot trust. Number two, sometimes your friends really have their own interests at heart, not yours. Sometimes it's to their advantage. I've seen many when they hit this kind of Midlife crisis, and there's no real age on that, but just midlife crisis, and, and they start trying to relive their, their college days and early young adult days, and so they're going out and, and, and partying and leaving the spouse with the kids, and I'm just going to, you know, girls' night out, which is girls' night out fine, I'm not saying it's not, but they start into that, guys' night, and, and they start hashing this stuff out, and what happens is your friends enjoy in time with you, and a, and a lot of times, too, if you've surrounded yourself with people who are not in your same season of life, who are doing things, and they want you more around, sometimes their advice is a little skewed. But number three, you need to get new friends. Because here's the thing. When your friends are recommending to you to do things that are against God's word, you need to get you new friends. Now, we can be a friend to the world, but we don't need to be friends with the world. And ultimately, let me tell you this. God's word trumps your friend's advice every time. Look at Psalm 1. The Bible says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Notice that progression. He walks, he stands, he sits. When you sit, you down, you with it. When you are listening to advice, that goes against God's word, you are being deceived. So I know you love your friends, but we got to love the word of God more. Number three, 
we argue too much or <laughs> we argue so much that we need to split so that we can be in a more peaceful environment. At least we'll be at peace if we're separate. Simple solution if you argue too much. Stop arguing. When you say we argue too much so we got to split, basically what you're saying is we argue so much and argue has su arguing has such a stronghold on me. Arguing is, has complete control over me that I cannot control it. It has absolute control over me. I cannot stop. I am a prisoner to arguing, so therefore I'm going to divorce. Two wrongs don't make a right. It's absolutely insanity. If one of your, listen, if, 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 if your other spouse or one of your kids came in and said, I'm, I'm addicted to heroin, alcohol has a hold on me, drugs have a hold on me, and I cannot stop. I am powerless against this, which is a kind of a great place to be when you're an addict because that means you've reached the bottom. I, but, but, there, but instead of stopping, it has a hold on me, and I'm going to keep doing it, so therefore I'm just going to separate myself from the rest of the world, and I'm going to keep doing drugs, and I'm going to die this way. Everybody else goes, no, 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 you ain't. Wait a minute. Hold on. That's not how you're supposed to live. You have the power over this. We can get you in rehab. We're going to do whatever it takes to fight, to win this thing. Same thing with arguing. You have control over arguing. When you say, basically what you're saying when you argue too much is, hey, there's no fruit of the Spirit in my life. There's no love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, or self-control. Why? Because I'm controlled by arguing. But if you're controlled by the fruit of the Spirit, you can overcome arguing. So stop arguing. If you're a parent... You would never allow your kid to walk into the house and say, Mom, Dad, I know I'm supposed to do my chores, but just it's every day when I walk into the house, my phone, look, watch, my phone overpowers me and it holds me down and I can't get up and I just have to text and I have to play video games. What would you say? You say, you better get up and do something about that thing. Same thing when you argue too much in marriage. You don't divorce because of it. You recognize it and you do something about it. Listen, it's not a philosophy philosophical issue bible says in luke 6 45 the man the good man or woman brings good things out of the good stored up in their heart and the evil man or woman brings evil things out of the evil stored up in their heart for out of the overflow of the heart the mouth speaks in other words your mouth's going to reveal what's in your heart if you're arguing too much it's not a philosophical or a marriage issue it's a heart issue and you need to change your heart number four we weren't Christians when we got married. We didn't get married in the church. So, excuse me? Listen, I don't care where you got married. I don't care who married you. And I really don't care about what spiritual condition you were in when you got married. The truth is God created marriage. And he recognizes that when you two publicly pronounced your love for one another and that you were together for life, God counted it. Done. You're married. It's amazing. You know, we, sometimes we talk about revisionist history. And that's why it's so important to keep history up to date and in order and recording the things that are going on just in the world today because inevitably there will be people who come along and try to change things. Like people who come along and go, the Holocaust was a big conspiracy. Millions of Jews were killed, and now today some people want to say that that never happened. Good grief. Revising history. It's amazing how many people have sat in my office and revised their marital history. Sometimes I was there for the wedding. I did the premarital counseling. I saw their Google eyes towards one another. I, I led them through those vows. They committed to one another. They were for life. And then five, six, seven years later, they're like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, I, you know, craziness. Look what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 7, 12 through 14. So the rest, to the rest I say that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband otherwise your children will be unclean but as it is they are holy and in essence he's saying look I know 
That in a technical sense, you are unequally yoked. A believer with an unbeliever. But you are now yoked. So therefore, you are together. Do not divorce because of spiritual condition. Because God will use you as a believer in the life of your unbelieving spouse to shine forth his gospel. Number five. We disagree on money or parenting. You will see on many lists, number one reason for divorce is financial issues, money, which is absolutely absurd because it costs you more to get divorced than it does to stay married. Think about this. No one, if I was to come up here and tell you, me and my wife, we bought a house at the beach and we've invested, we've remodeled that thing and we've put in all kinds of things and we've put a million dollars into that house. And you know what we decided to do? We just decided to leave it there. And whoever wants to come along can have it. You say, you're crazy. Where's your ROI? Where's your return on investment? Nobody does that. That's insanity. But yet we do it with marriage. Think of all the financial things you've invested in. Cost of the marriage, all the food, all the kids stuff, every, all the house, all the cars, all the stuff you own. And then you're going to walk away because of money? There is a reason divorce attorneys are rich and divorce people are poor. Anybody ever met? I know a couple. Anybody ever met a divorce attorney who ain't rich? If, and listen, no offense to you if you're a divorce attorney here today, but why is divorce attorney even a job? Think about this. Why is that even a thing? God says, why do we need somebody to help us do something that God told us not to do anyway unless we're selfish and want to make sure we get ours? Divorce attorney should not even be a job. And people talk about, well, I'm going to tell you, somebody's going to have to give account for all these abortions and all the money that's been spent on. And that's true. But let me tell you something. You don't think all the people who spent money on divorces aren't going to have to give an account to God too? You don't think God's not going to ask the question, let me tell you about all the money that we could have spent saving dying children in another country or bringing people to the gospel that you spent on something I told you not to do to begin with. So don't use money. And then... There's parenting. People will actually say, we'll be better parents if we just split up. And then at least our kids will be at peace. So let me get this straight. Splitting the children up into two separate households is going to be better for the kids. Now, I get worked up on this. I'm sorry. Because you don't know how many people I've set in my office, adult and children, who deal with the shrapnel of the day their parents decided they weren't going to make it anymore. And if you trace it all the way back down, it always ends up with, well, my parents split at... So splitting up and putting them into two separate households is going to be better, right? Two two separate lists of expectations. Two separate parenting styles. Then there's all the junk that one spouse tells about the other. Then there's shared holidays, shared vacations, inconsistent schedules, all the money that you spend here and there, going back and forth. You introduce them to your new boyfriend or girlfriend or you and your husband or your new wife, and that's going to make you better parents and be better for the kids. Well, kids are resilient. You a doggone fool. They never get over it. What are you thinking? Come on, man. Typically, nine times out of ten, when we get to this point, let me tell you what's really happening. When people use that one, typically, sexual organs are outrunning cerebral organs. And neither organ is allowing the heart a chance to speak. As a matter of fact, sexual organs are outrunning the cerebral organs and the sexual organs have duped the person into believing that it's the heart that is speaking when it's really the sexual organs that are speaking because really the heart hasn't had a chance to speak because the person doesn't want to hear from the heart because to go back and deal with all that is just too painful. So I'll just follow my sexual organs. 
you have no idea. No one ever gets over it. Number six. Preacher. Listen. I know that God wants me to be happy. (laughs) Is that so? I'm going to need a little chapter verse on that one. Now let me tell you real quick. Philippians chapter 4 verse 4. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 16. Rejoice always. Y'all understand that's a command, right? Now here's the difference. Happiness is a slave to circumstance. Things are great, happy. Things are bad, sad. (laughs) Joy is happiness that is sustained regardless of circumstance. Joy is when the apostles are beaten and come out rejoicing in the Lord. Joy is the apostles in the middle of prison. Joy is Jesus. Listen. When we say, I just want to be happy and I'm not happy, we're basically saying, I'm a slave to my circumstances. There's no, I'm unhappy and there's nothing I can do about it. You do understand that as a believer in Jesus Christ, if, you, if there was no way that you could rejoice in any circumstance, he would have never commanded you to do so. But by the power of the Holy Spirit within you, you can rejoice. I want to tell you this, as God has called us and saved us, he began this process of growing us, and in that process, there's going to be ups and downs, there's going to be good days and bad days, so therefore there are going to be times when you're happy and sometimes when you're not overly happy, but for a believer in Jesus Christ, joy sustains through all of that. And here's the thing, you're not a victim. With the Holy Spirit within you, you can embrace joy. So don't tell me, well, I just want to be happy. I'm telling you, you can be happy with the joy of the Lord because that's your strength. You don't divorce because you're not happy. Number seven, we've grown apart. We've simply grown apart. Man went to the Super Bowl. He sat down. He sat in the middle, and there was about six or seven empty seats around him. People in front of him looked back and said, dude, what's up? I mean, where's, where's all your people? Did you just buy all those seats, spend all that money just so you could have some space? He said, no. My friends are, fa- I just got to be honest with you, my wife just died this week, and my friends or family could not make it. Oh, that's awful. I'm so sorry to hear. But, I mean, not even one friend or family, none of them could make it. No, not a one. I mean, but, dude, dude, this is the biggest game of the year. This is the Super Bowl. It's the game of the century. Not even one friend or family. He said, no, they're all at the funeral. (laughs) My wife's funeral. Fact is, you're going to grow apart in your marriage. Things are going to happen. Callie, I asked Callie to come up here and uh, help me illustrate this. So here's what happens in a marriage. So, first happens, come on over here, Callie. First, we get married. We're happy. Hey. All right. Now, I know Callie's a little older than I am, but you just have to do your, do your best to imagine this. So, anyway. But, so, you get married, and then, hey, we're happy. Hey, now. And then, things begin to happen. A few years go by, and you actually do begin to grow apart. Bills start to come in. Some debt may accrue. Phones may go off in worship services that shouldn't be going off. And then kids come along. 
And then you have disagreements. And you disagree about that and this. And really, you actually do grow apart. And then all of a sudden, you wake up one day and you look across and you go, oh my, we've grown apart. Now what you don't do is go, well, my bad, I guess it's time to leave. No, no, no. You go, hey, we've grown apart. So how about we do this? Why don't we reconnect? And see how it takes mutual submission. That's the whole I do, I do part in the marriage. And you pull yourselves back together. You do whatever you can to get back together. And here you are. You're back together. That's why, thank you, Kelly. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 19, what I, listen, you got man, woman. That's why a man's going to leave his mother and father, be united to his wife. Wife's going to come and the two will be one. When you have two distinct personalities who are brought into one, there's going to be some tension and there's going to be some growing apart. But he said, what God has put together, let no one separate. So when you grow apart, pull yourselves back together under the supervision of the Holy Spirit. Philippians 2.12 says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Well, you not only work on your salvation, you got to continue to work out your marriage with fear and trembling as well. If you grow apart, it's normal. Pull yourselves back together. Number eight, I cannot forgive them, but also I know that if I do this, God will forgive me. Man, I understand. I understand what's being said there. I understand on one hand the amount of hurt that can go on when you've invested your life in someone and they betray you or it's, it's, you get so hurt by them. I also understand on the other side where we exalt the grace of God. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, God's grace, that's what he died on the cross for, it can sustain you. So I understand both, but listen, they are illegitimate reasons to get a divorce. Neither holds up. And here's why. The truth is that if God forgives us, if God forgives us for the sins that we have committed, then we too can take that and we can forgive others. You actually have a choice. Well, I can't. I can't do it. You can't. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. If he, the one who forgave me, tells me that I got to forgive others, guess what? I need to forgive others. Do you realize how, honestly, how arrogant and rude a statement it is to say, I will embrace the forgiveness that God gives me, but I refuse to grant forgiveness to someone else? Do you understand how hypocritical and ridiculous that is. In fact, in the Sermon on the Mount, after Jesus talked about prayer, in Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, he says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Man, that is a heavy verse. We're not talking about salvation there, but we are talking about life, intimacy with the Lord. In other words, God, I want to be all in with you. I'll tell you what, I'm not putting up with that. I'm not forgiving them. I'm not doing that. He says, "Uh uh-uh, don't come to me until you've taken what I give you and extend it to other people. Grace and forgiveness that is received is expected to be extended to others. Don't buy into, they don't deserve my forgiveness. Well, I'm going to walk, and then God will forgive me. Listen, our relationship with God comes first, but it is through that relationship with God that we are able to extend forgiveness and grace to others. So rounding this out, number nine, we fell out of love. Or... Some people will even say, you know what? I'm not sure we were ever in love to begin with. I need to find my soulmate. I thought they were your soulmate. They were the day you said I do. Hear me. Hear me. Feelings come and go. Love is a choice. Your marital love, your covenant love is not based upon feelings. You are not always going to feel like being in love. 
But your love is a choice that you make in spite of how you feel. But I'm not sure we were ever in love. I'm not sure they're my soulmate. Listen to me. Hear this truth. The idea that there is one soulmate and one person out there and one person alone entirely on planet earth and one only for you is not a biblically supported idea. How do you know there's only one for you? You've been to the beaches of Brazil? You've been to London? You've been to Italy? There might be some woman running around in Italy right now you might be better suited for. If that's the case, you better get with it and get on over there and find them. How do you, how do you know? And if that's the case, then statistically half the people in here have got it wrong. And if you got it wrong and you did divorce, does that mean God was wrong too? Because if he intentionally planned only one person for you, then why did he let you get married to the wrong person to begin with? And in a church, come on now. Your love is not based on feelings. It is a choice that you make. Feelings come and go. Well, how do you know? How am I going to know if they're right, the right person or not? You want to know? Listen, I dated my wife for eight years. I know, God bless her soul. <laughs> People ask me, when you said I do, man, you took so long. How did you know she was the one? How did you know? How did you finally make that decision? And here's the honest answer. You want to know, the mo there was a moment I knew exactly she was the one. You know when it was? It was the moment that dude right there declared us husband and wife. Because from that point forward, it mattered not what my feelings were, which is why it took me eight years. I was waiting for a feeling. It did not matter. What mattered was covenant. Hear me. It is not your love that sustains the marriage covenant. It is the marriage covenant that sustains your love. Number 10, and probably the most used phrase that you find in divorce documents irreconcilable differences irreconcilable differences it's the most technical term it's the most used term but as a believer it's probably the most irrational term irreconcilable differences we use it as a catch-all. Any points of disagreement, any points of disunity, anything we don't like about the other person, well, we're, we're irreconcilable, really. In fact, just this week in the news, two more famous stars. I mean, I don't know how anybody in Hollywood stays married, but two more famous stars came. We're going to call it quits. Look, this was back. Wedding of the century. My goodness. Reports were, listen to this. They, they're divorcing for irreconcilable differences. One of those differences, one of the main ones, is serious business now. Jennifer wants to live in California. Justin wants to live in New York. No way to reconcile that. Now, I think they got enough money to fly back and forth, you think? Listen, here's the truth. The whole gospel of Jesus Christ <coughs> proclaims reconciliation. If a holy, perfect God can reconcile sinful man, sinful, wicked man to himself, then this God can reconcile any two individuals who are willing to submit to him. It doesn't have to be irreconcilable. But it does have to be submission to the Lord and to his plan. The gospel. We, we, are, we are, in fact, the Bible calls us, it labels us, ministers of reconciliation. So for the believer in Jesus Christ, it cannot be irreconcilable through the power of the Holy Spirit. He can bring all things together for his glory. Because when we reconcile, he is glorified through that. 
We mentioned this at the end of last week's message, but in Ephesians 5, it basically says when I'm talking about marriage, I'm talking about the church. Meaning our marriages are to be proclamations of the gospel of Jesus Christ who is the bridegroom being wedded to his bride. And my friends, that is never going to separate. If he brought us together, he can keep us together if we are committed to one another. It does not have to be reconcilable, but we got to submit to him. So we're just going to close today giving you an opportunity where you are to make that prayer for God to make the irreconcilable at least seemingly in your mind to do to make it reconcilable because he says what's impossible with man it's possible with me it's possible maybe your marriage is not in an impossible place today but you got something else in an impossible place and you need to ask the Lord to bring it to life. I remember one time I was standing in my um, funeral home. We were looking at the body. Funeral director says, well, y'all need to get out because the embalmer is here. That was, that was odd. It was just odd for me. But I guess it was fitting. I mean, there was a dead body. They're like, you need to get out. Here's the embalmer. Okay. But you know one place you'll never see an embalmer? You ever been like in the hospital and your spouse is there or your kid is there and they're still alive, but they're just trying to get well? Can you imagine if a doctor came in and said, we need everybody out. The embalmer is here to embalm the body. You'd be like, what? What? No, no, no. We still have a heartbeat. We still have air. Many of you have called the embalmer far too soon on your marriage. Don't you give up. As long as you got a heartbeat, you got a way.